Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from, and welcome, welcome to our ARM Tech Talk series. This is the place for the latest and greatest in trends, technologies, and best practices from ARM and our ecosystem. It's so great you can join us today for our, uh, for our ARM Tech Talk. I'm thrilled you can join us, whether you're joining us here on Zoom, hello folks to you, or on YouTube, it's great to have you wherever you're joining us from in the world. If you've attended any of our tech talks before, you know the drill of what I'm just about to run through before we get into a really exciting topic today. If you haven't, particular warm welcome to you, and I'm just going to go through a bit of housekeeping uh, before we get started. So if we can go to the next slide, please, that would be amazing. Uh, we, of course, you know, you can get involved in the conversation, not just through, uh, in, through, uh, through our Q&A later on today in our talk, but you can tweet us at arm software dev use the hashtag aivtt to do so we've done over 50 of these tech talks we've been doing this for two years or so now we've got a whole host of tech talk topics that you can go and check out on our arm software developers youtube channel i'll paste the link to that in the chat shortly as well as the link to arm.com slash tech talks though hopefully that's short enough for you to just type in if you want to sign up for any of our upcoming talks uh this year Talking about upcoming talks, we've got one more coming up before we break for the holidays, before we break for Christmas on December 6th. That's how we're giving a talk on how you can get started with AI at the edge with a workshop from Arm. Uh, so do check that out. We're really, really excited about that. And of course, we'll uh, break for the Christmas break. And then in the new year, we're going to have some very, very exciting new things emerging for the Tech Talk series. We've got a new platform. We're going to be doing new topics whole host of new talks it's going to be really really exciting i'm super excited about it so stay tuned for that make sure you're subscribed to our youtube channel make sure you're following us on twitter and also all on our our mailing lists if you're not already because that's going to be really exciting i can't wait that's all in the future though right let's talk about today today's talk is from bonsai and they're going to be talking about continuous learning beyond the edge it's a really interesting topic today i'm thrilled that julian and the uh, julian and the bonsai team are able to talk to us today uh, he's joining us from sunny marseille and when he isn't doing uh fantastic hopefully it's sunny there julian and i'm guessing it's definitely not sunny in the uk uh can you confirm if it's nice and sunny uh, yeah, yeah it's always sunny in marseille you know <laughs> Of course it is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, when you're not doing uh, amazing stuff and working as a CTO of Bonsai with the fantastic team there uh, down and working in Marseille, uh, Julian shared with me just before we uh, went live that uh, before his days in Bonsai, he used to play in a band. So uh, feel free to uh, reach out and ask him anything about that uh, uh, at any time. Pretty, really interesting stuff. So uh, I think you're pretty busy with bonsai, though, right? Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't got time to do that now, but uh, back in the yeah. day, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when I was in Thales, yes, I had some time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, well, look, if you've got any questions at any point during today's tech talk, then please use the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom. If you're on YouTube, just head on over. I pasted the link to the uh, Zoom link. You can ask a question to Julian and the team here. That's enough from me, Julian. Really excited you could be here today. It's great to have you. I'm going to hand it over to you to talk us through all about Bonsai and your very exciting work you're doing uh, in the AI space. Julian, yeah. the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to, excited too because you you know we have been working on this uh, product DevNC for some months right now, and now it's ready and we are ready to show it to the world. And we show it the first time with uh, in your show, <laughs> so it's a it's a good time for us. And uh, I hope it will be a milestone, you know, in embedded AI, because what we do is pretty new and pretty exciting. So uh, I, I hope I will prove it to you right now. Um, so personally, so I, I come from uh, from Thales, so Thales DIS, uh, which was called before Gemalto. So I, I was doing some smart cards. I've been doing smart cards for 20 years, <laughs> and it's a long time. And smart cards are very, uh, really, smart and better software you know and at the end of my uh, my career in, in, in Thales, i started uh, trying to do some uh, deep learning inside the smart cards <laughs> it's it was not easy i tried to do it during two years and i didn't manage to so i managed to do some inference but the training was not possible and if you want to to have security you know in a smart card you, you cannot do the training outside the smart card and that's why it was really interesting when Bonsai came came to me and I say, okay, we, we can't do that, you know. <laughs> so I, know, I don't believe you, and though, as they show me and uh, no, uh, 
I'm in, in bonsai. I'm very happy to 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 did the jump uh, at this time. So uh, what we are going to talk uh, today is uh, about uh, bonsai and the team. Uh, and then I will explain you our product, which is called DaVinci. Uh, what you can do with it, what is new, uh, why I think is a real milestone in uh, embedded AI. Uh, and then we will end with a, a demo. I hope it will be the, the main part of the show. <laughs> uh, okay, so Bonsai is a, a young startup. Uh, it started uh, one year ago. Even if the research started five years ago in Montpellier, in the University of Montpellier with Bijan, it's only one year old. Uh, now we have a product that we we are we are testing. We are in evolution phase with uh, tens of companies, a uh, lot of different companies, uh, just small companies, uh, big companies, companies that are doing big volumes. You know, like uh, sensors and so on. So you have millions of sensors that produce where we we aim to put uh, DaVinci in, but also smaller smaller volumes. For example, when when we go to production, you know, when we go some. Uh, voice agent recognition in, in production. This is more volume, but we can do it that also. So we, we can fit uh, big companies, small companies. And our very goal is to, to make, is to democratize the AI, you know, the embedded AI, make it very easy, which is not the case today. So if uh, just to present the team rapidly. So Bijan is our CSO, he's uh, the chercher that invented the uh, Diplomat, which is our algorithm, is a father of the company somehow. Uh, Alain, is, Alain is our CEO, so he has a long, long experience in the building companies. Uh, Jean-Michel was the first engineer in the, in, in, in the company. He, he made the first prototypes. Uh, he had a hard time, you know. <laughs> he had all the, the problems at the beginning. I know it's okay. And Theo, Theo is a new uh, newcomer. He's uh, from one month. Now he's dealing with all the tooling, you know, the tooling part, because we have a, a, a tool that uh, make it easy to use DaVinci. As his part is, uh, is on the, our cloud, and uh, he's dealing with all the cloud uh, concerns. And Gian is our uh, digital processing engineer. So he deals with images, with uh, sound, uh, and so on and so on. So let's go to to DaVinci. So the problem we we aim uh, to solve with DaVinci is how to use how to to make products, actual products, with uh, AI in industry, not not uh, general AI, but in industry, you know, in uh, I, I, IoT, in industry four point zero, in AIoT, and so on and so. On. So there are three three big problems when you want to do products. Uh, and not prox, we want to do products, which, which is our goal. The first problem is, uh, you know, everybody knows that is you have to, to collect data, you have to build a data set with qualitative data. The second problem is is, uh, is ROI. So uh, it's, it's very long to make uh, AI uh, products. You have to make it fit in the device. So it's very long and uh, often when you reach the step, we want to have a product, 60% uh, of the project stop there. And then the very, very big problem is a model drift. So because you you have a device, it seems it's working fine in your laboratory when you do your test, but when you deploy it on the on the ground on the field, everything is going uh, is going wrong because the, the reality is not the theory of your database. And this is a big problem is a model drift. Uh, so how, how we are going to solve this problem, or how we are solving it actually. Uh, first, the main thing is that we learn directly on device. We don't learn on the cloud and then do the inference on device. We learn on device. Uh, so if and we, uh, we don't have any cloud dependency. So when you learn on device, you don't need to build a data set beforehand. You build it directly on the device. So you do some tests in evaluation phase, maybe on the cloud to test it rapidly with no hardware constraint and so on. Then you go to the hardware and then you build your your actual data set on the hardware with the very specific data of your use case. For example, uh, if you, you want to use your model in a factory, you have to use the uh, data coming from the factory, not from a factory uh, also in the other part of the world. You, you have to build the data set with the data coming from the actual factory where, where you want to put your device. 
And the second thing is that we have a, a system that can adapt to any microcontroller or any computer, any CPU. It can scale automatically. So you build your, your model, and then the DaVinci will take care of the scaling of the model regarding the, the resources of, the, of, of your device. So if you have a, a small device, you, have, you really have a small model, maybe not as powerful as a, on a big device, but it's still, it's still, it will still work. So for example, if you use a computer, you can, uh, you can recognize uh, 100 different users, but if you are on a, a microcontroller, you will recognize only three different users. But your, mod your model will be the same, it will scale with the device you put it on. And so the part, uh, the more important, that as you can learn continuously or incrementally on, on your device, uh, you fix the model drift problem, the performance drift problem. Because if something happens, you learn the new, the new, uh, the new environment. So let's go in detail on all the solutions. So the first one, the, the, the thing that we have, we have a treasure <laughs> in Bonsai, it's our algorithm, which, which was invented by Bijan. And this algorithm has a, is very specific because you can learn from very few data. You can start having a very good performances. I will show it in the demo with very few data. Uh, it needs only some, some samples. So, we can, so the consequences of that is that you don't need a very big data set to, to work. So you don't need a lot of memory. You, you, you don't need a lot of CPU time to, to train the model. So you can train it very fast, so you can be real time. Uh, the other point is that our algorithm does not need any accelerator. It doesn't need any GPU, any, any t nor TPU. And so it's very portable, so you can put it anywhere. And that's, that's why we can, we can uh, handle the, the whole uh, range of products of ARM, you know, starting from M0 to M7 and so on. And the, 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 the final point is, is it is uh, deterministic, meaning that if you have a data set, you always, always get the same result as the end. You always get the same network and the same result in inference. It's totally de deterministic. There is no random data uh, at all in the process. Uh, okay. So next point, uh, the system. So the system is, uh, you know, it's something very easy to use. It, uh, it comes, you put it on your device, on your device and it works directly. Uh, and it scales your model to the device. And it, it takes it take care of the discrepancy be between all the devices. If you have a big device, a small device, a small, uh, devices with flash, not, no flash and so on. And it's very easy to use, this is the goal. So you, you take care only of your business rule, your business problem, and the device take care of all other things. And so what it permits is it permits to scale what, what we call vertical scaling. So depending on the device you have, you have you, it will adapt the model. But also we have a capacity to distribute our model or our application uh, on different devices. So you can, you can uh, spread the workload on different devices. And you can uh, uh, <laughs> delegate some, some computing on, on big devices, for example, if you want to do voice recognition, you, you, you give it to big devices and you want to do a VAD, so voice activity detection, you can put it on small devices and so on. So you can do hierarchical uh, intelligence. So if we go in details, there are several parts. Uh, the two uh, light green parts are the ones that are in ch at the charge of the, our customers. So, this is the one that the customer can uh, change. The agent service layer on the top is uh, the part which is relative to the business rules, which depends on the application in which it, it will fit. The lower layer is the adaptation layer. So it adapts DaVinci uh, to the hardware. So it's a very thin layer. Even the agent service layer is very thin, it's very easy to, to implement but it, it permits to, to customize DaVinci for your very, your very own problem and very own hardware. So if your hardware is a microcontroller, you have to, to manage uh, the flash and so on. And this is a adaptation layer that takes care of that. The, so if you look at the blue, uh, at the blue part, uh, 
So the blue part is a standard part. It's a totally standard. It doesn't change uh, regarding the device or the use case. The first part is the pre-processing. So the pre-processing uh, here is a part that takes the analog signal and make it uh, and extract some feature from it because Dale needs some uh, feature extraction before working. So Dale is our algorithm. It's a diplomat augmented learning engine. And it, 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 uh, it needs some uh, feature uh, as an input that the preprocessing uh, take care of the extracting those features from the raw signal. The post-processing is uh, what adapts the output of, of uh, Dale to, to your use case. So if you need some data smoothing or something at the, at the end, uh, the post-processing will do that. And the system is all the other concerns. So because when you operate uh, a learning uh, algorithm on device, you need to, to manage a local database. And so this, our system manages the local database. It takes care that it's not too big, not too, not too, too small, and so on. It also handles the communication. So you have three types of communication. You can communicate with, with your user because you need user feedback. So sometimes when you want to learn, when, we, when you, you do supervised learning on device, you need user feedback. So we have a communication to the UI. Uh, I will show that in the demo. It gets, takes care of the communication between devices. If you if you want to distribute your intelligence across different devices, you have the com this communication. And third, it takes care of the communication with the backend if you want to do some remote administration. So this is a system uh, that we, we built around Dale. And uh, so the last part, I, I talked about this. Third point, so the third point is a model drift problem. So, to, to, to give an example, uh, two, two, two months ago, we were invited by, uh, by one of our customers in, uh, in their office. And so it was a kind of trap because their office was a factory uh, where we had to test. So it was 90 decibel loud. And we have to test our command recognition algorithm into this environment. So actually it worked so it was a pretty good experience so this is what this uh, this schema represents so you can see this is uh, the command acceptance rate of uh, of the solution the red one is davinci and the white one is one of our well known competitors in the domain of uh, speech recognition so we have uh, several events. We have a first event, which is, uh, for example, your, the operator is sick, his voice is changing, <coughs> he, he, he cannot talk anymore, his voice is slightly changing. And then we, we, you can see that our competitor uh, performance is, is uh, falling, and uh, so our also is, is even falling uh, lower because our network is, is smaller than the, our competitor. But with the intervention of the user, you can we can get back to optimal performance because we, we we learn the new voice of the user and we can adapt to, to, the new, <coughs> to the new situation. And this is what we call incremental learning. So, so this is something you can do if you can learn very fast, because uh, when we learn, it takes only one second to learn a, a new model. And when, when I tell learn a new model, it's not just adapt the model, it's create a new model from scratch to, uh, to a full model. So it takes only one second, so we can adapt very quickly. And uh, the second event here is a uh, loud noise in the background. For example, a new industrial machine that is starting with 90 decibel. And then you see uh, uh, our computer, competitor performances keep falling. And our, we, we fall also, but we can adapt because we learn continuously the, the background noise. And we add this noise to our database. We do, we do some live data augmentation to the database and we build a new model and our, our new model can adapt to the new noise uh, uh, environment. Okay. So our last point is that we, so the revolution actually is that we, we increase the, the productivity of the AI process, the product, uh, new product introduction. So already, if you want to do uh, IoT product, uh, it's uh, 20 months, it's uh, 30 months. And if you add uh, AI to this product, 
it's it's getting even worse. You know, it, it can go to 60 months, 70 months because it's all the problems that I explained before. You have the, the construction of the data set and so on, the, the optimization of the algorithm for your embedded device and, and the model risk and so on and so on. And you have to do a lot of iteration, uh, a lot of fallback to data set uh, construction, model uh, building, and so on and so on. So what we propose is a new process, which is fit forward. We uh, we always go straight forward, never go back. So the first step is the evaluation phase that you you where you test your data set, not your data set, but the, the nature of your data, because you, you don't need a full data set. You, you need a, only a sample of your data set. You put it in our cloud, and then you can test if uh, DaVinci is a solution to your problem. So you tweak some parameters. You do some tests, and when you are OK with that, you say, OK, I, I go on, I go, I go to the design file. So I want to go on an actual device. I want to go on an arm power device. And then you, you take the parameters that you, you selected on the cloud, and you put it directly on the device, and it's working, because DaVinci take care of the adaptation to the device. And then you can start playing you know, with the constraint of the device, maybe slower, so you have to change some settings. Or maybe when you start to testing it on, on the field with a true microphone, or I don't know, a true sensor, your, your algorithm is not as efficient as it was on the cloud. So you have to do, do some adaptation. And then you can still do it thanks to DaVinci and MySQL, the, the tool that comes with DaVinci. And you can adapt directly on the device. So you, you change the, the setting directly on the device, you test it, and it's very easy. It's a very quick iteration. And when you are happy with that, you, you can go to production. So then we, we will help you produce, produce thousands of devices, batches of devices, or millions, maybe. And uh, even on the, when the device is on the field, even if the, something which is not planned happened on the field, which is not expected, you, you still can uh, resolve the problem because DaVinci uh, still learn on the, on the field. So it will adapt automatically. Maybe with the help of the user, but it will still adapt on the field. No need to go back to uh, you know data collection, to making a new <coughs> a new model, new uh, new optimization, and so on. All the whole cycle, very long cycle, two year cycle. You don't have to do that. You change directly on the field. So I'm done with the presentation. So what we saw. Is that the, so the, there are a lot of problems of doing AI on, on, on target. And if you want to, uh, the main problem is model drift. If you want to solve the model drift, there are two solutions actually. There is the first solution, which is uh, MLOps. So MLOps is a, is a the, the current solution, but it's quite TV. You need a big infrastructure, you need a cloud. You need, uh, you need to be able to update your firmware on the, on the field. On, on small microcontrollers, it's not always possible. If you are on Lua, it's not always possible. And uh, you have to do all those, this cycle. So you have to, to get the data set, put it on, on the cloud, make a new model, validate this model. You, you have to involve new data scientists and so on. Make sure your model is still working on the device and uh, send it back to the device. And this is a very long, very long process. So if the other solution is to learn directly on the device. This is what we propose, and this is what we do. And we can do that because we have a specific algorithm. This specific algorithm can learn from very small data set. And uh, this is uh, the, main, the main selling point uh, of, this, uh, of DaVinci. But OK, so now you can learn on the device. But the, the problem you have is that, OK, you are able to learn, but if you're able to run on a device, you have to manage the database. You have to manage the communication with the user, with the backend, and so on and so on. And also that we, we take care uh, of it. And uh, this is the, 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 the goal of DaVinci, is to take care of all the hustle coming with the managing uh, learning algorithm on the device. OK, so I think it's time to go to the demo. Uh, let me. So the demo. Uh, this is a, what we will show is a beta version of DaVinci. It, it's running uh, on the cloud because we want to reach the maximum people. We, have, we want to have a lot of feedback and uh, we want a lot of people to test DaVinci. So we put it on the cloud. So there is a, what we call a DaVinci agent on the cloud, which is running. 
Uh, and to manage this agent, we, we will give you a uh, Maestro CLI. So Maestro is our tool. Uh, so this is beta version, of, uh, alpha version of Maestro, which is a, right now it's a CLI. Later on, it will be a real uh, GUI on the cloud uh, with a, on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the browser. Right now it's a CLI. So with this CLI, you can manage the execution of the, of the training and the inference in the cloud. What you have locally is your data set and some, uh, some settings you have to, to take care of. And uh, that's all. So let's go to the demo. I will show you that directly. So I launched the CLI. So here, here's the CLI. Um, there are several parts. On the top, we have a menu, so you can create a new project, open an ex existing project, get some help. You have some settings here with the mode you want to use, if you want to do evaluation, simulation. You have several use cases, because for a given agent, for example, if you have an audio agent, you can uh, have a voice recognition, you have noise recognition, so you can, you can build several use cases on the same agent. On the, on the bottom here, you will see the some KPI, so uh, how many, how much time did, that, did it take to train the model? How much time did it take to, to do the inference? How much memory and so on? And on the right part, we have the, the result of the, of the inferences. So you will, you will have a, <coughs> a confusion matrix that will appear here. So let's start. So I start by opening a, a project that I, I prepared. It's a project uh, for, about OCR, so OCR, opti optical character recognition. So we try to recognize unwritten characters. Uh, so it's based on MNIST, which is a well-known uh, a well-known data set with uh, 80,000 character for training and 10,000 for for inference. But if I go to the what we have what use actually, so this is a this is a, the directory uh, where I put my data set for, for the demo. So I can, can look, we can have a look at the data set. So there are two parts, the train part and the test part. So you can see that we, we, we take only a very small subset of uh, MNIST work. We don't need the whole data set. We can start to work with uh, 10 images, 20 images per, per class. So you can see if you know MNIST, you can recognize uh, the characters. Okay. Uh, so let me start. So uh, yeah, I will just show you. So we have a file here uh, that describes the data set. So, so just to show you the performances, we, I will start with only one, one record per, uh, per class and look at what is, uh, uh, how it's working. Let's start. So yeah, what, what happens is that I, we take uh, all the data, we send it to the cloud. On the cloud, we do the training. So doing the training is, it means building a new, brand new model from scratch. Then we use this model, we test it with, uh, right here yeah, we'll see it, but it's uh, 2,000 records. And then we get the, the result back and download it on your computer. So on the right, this is a confusion matrix. Uh, I have to, to hide this stuff. Uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, so you, you can see that the, the, the accuracy is more. It's a uh, 50% because we are only have one item per class. And you can see, uh, it's not, so these are not very good. It's very good for zero, because maybe zero is very easy to recognize for the algorithm. It's very good for two, but all other, all other characters are not well recognized. Uh, if, uh, if we look at the KPI, it's not very interesting because we have only one record per data set. So let's increase the number of records. Let's go to five record per data set. Let's run again. So again, uh, we'll uh, train the model. So create a brand new model and then infer again with five items per per classes. So the yeah the the accuracy is a bit 
better. It's seventy uh, percent, and you can see it's, uh, it's better. Now it, it uh, managed to recognize the one, the two, but it still it still have hard time to recognize the five, for example. Uh, okay, so the goal usually is to get 90% uh, of accuracy. So let, let's try to add this. Uh, let's try to add 20 records per data set. Uh, let me. Uh, okay, so let's set 20 records per data set, per classes, sorry. I upload uh, again all the data set, create a new. Uh, a new network to the entrance. Okay, and now we are 90%. It's okay. And uh, you can see that the confusion matrix is a bit better. So for those who don't know the confusion matrix, on the left, you have the characters that is expected, on the top, the, the characters that was predicted. So when you're on the diagonal, it's good. <laughs> Barely. Uh, concerning the KPIs, you can see that the world training took us. 40 milliseconds, so which is not a lot for training with uh, 20 records per, per class, so 200 records. And this time, take care of uh, loading the data set, uh, doing the pre processing, and do, doing the training itself, so creating a new network. Then we go to the inference, so the whole inference on 200 records is once, once we go on to a, a bit more than one second. If you look at the details, uh, the pre-processing pre time for uh, one training that the uh, data set is uh, 29 milliseconds. So we can do it real time. If you look at the, I'm oh, sorry, so it's the pre-processing, yeah. And the training is uh, even less, it's uh, 11 milliseconds. So every, it's very fast and you can learn continuously. This is a goal. If you look at the memory needed, is about, so this is a memory, the work memory needed to for the training. So we need a, a bit more memory for the training, but it's only uh, 100 kilobytes. So you can fit on a, on a microcontroller. You can fit on a M4, for example, very easily. Uh, so we can do this, uh, this training on an M4. And the, the database memory, is, it will be stored in flash, typically on a, on a microcontroller is 45 kilobytes, and the network itself is uh, 16 kilobytes. Uh, concerning the inference, it's even faster because it's easier. Uh, it's one, uh, one millisecond for, for the preprocessing, and uh, we cannot even measure the, the inference time. And the memory needed for inference is uh, 12 kilobytes. Okay, so now that we have our 90%, which is theoretical, let, let, let's try to test, it, to test it with live conditions. So I will go to the simulation uh, mode and launch DaVinci in simulation. So it will start, it will load the initial data set, and then it will wait for events coming from the UI. So I will show you the UI that uh, I will do in this weekend. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't practice my guitar because of that. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so we have two demo right now. We have this OCR demo that I show you. I connect to, uh, to the device. Okay, so uh, on the, on the center we have a canvas where I can write some some digits, and uh, on the le on the right you have the digits that will be recognized by DaVinci. Uh, we start in uh, not incremental mode, so it's let's say uh, the standard mode, uh, just to see how it's reacting. So we have 90% of accuracy. Uh, let's look at what it, how it feels. So I do a two. I try. So it's okay. It recognizes a two. Let's say several times. Okay. Oh, yeah, it mistook. So I correct it just to keep track of the errors. I do several several tests. So I, I, again, error, an error. Uh, again, an error. So actually, it doesn't feel exactly like 90% of accuracy. 
And uh, this is what we call the model drift. And this is what, what we want to solve. Because what, what happened is that we, we learn on a theoretical data, database, but I have my own writing style, which is not totally standard. My two are a bit uh, strange. And we would like the system to, to adapt to, to that. So we, we start the incremental mode. So now, from now, when I press one of those buttons, it will train, it will create a new, brand new model from scratch again. With the new, uh, with the new, so it will keep the data set as it is, but it, it will it will add a new record in it. So let's try. Now I do a two. Okay, so it mistook. So I teach Davin C this this two, and I try it again. Okay, so, so now it recognizes my two. Let's do it several times. Okay, it's still rocking. Okay, it mistook. So I train it again. And you can see that the performances are getting better with time. And the user can always correct the network with a, a quick and very easy interaction with the system. So this is uh, what we, tr we try to do is a very easy user experience. You know, just click one button you, and you correct the system. And you can see that now we are near the 90% that we, that we were promised by the theory. Again, but yeah, you, you can see that it's improving with time. And for example, uh, if I want to replace my zero by a, by a heart, because I'm a, I'm a French lover, you know, uh, oh, I'll try. Okay, so a mistake. So I teach them in C that my heart is a zero. Uh, now it starts recognizing the heart as a, as a zero. Right, so. Let's try to teach it again. Okay, so zero is okay. Okay, you can see now it knows that my heart is a zero. Okay, so that's that's all for the demo. Uh, so you can see that the what the model risk is real problem. And I know it's not a trivial problem. Every time you go to the field, uh, you you get this problem, and so you can see that. With only 20 records per, per class, which you can start working. And so we can do, go on the device and we can increase the database uh, lively and we can uh, adapt to the new situation. Uh, okay, so that's all for me, Tobias. Maybe if you have some question. I, I, I cannot hear you. There we go. That's my yeah. bad. my bad. It's the first <laughs> one, one, only one of the day of you're on mute. Uh, thank you so much, Julian. I don't know if you want to just turn a light on quickly at your side because you're coming up quite uh, quite dark. It gets very oh, dark. Yeah, sorry. Stadium, <laughs> so. <laughs> so, but that's awesome. You know, getting to be able to see the breadth yeah. of AI on uh, from ARM ecosystem partners in the last few weeks that we have has been uh, phenomenal. And this is this is no exception, right? This has been a fantastic. You've got a demo, you've got latest and greatest ARM tech, um, you know, ARM-based technology running on, and as you said, right, Julian, it runs on any ARM Cortex processor, yeah, yeah, correct? Yeah. We, we, we have a demo yeah. running on an M4 where, where you can recognize up to three, uh, three users. You, know, you, you can record three users live, and we can recognize the, uh, those users live. So if there's folks, if there's people on the the call interested in trying this out and uh, and and getting in contact with you, what's the what's the best way to do this? How can yeah, they get their so, hands on DaVinci? Yeah, yeah, you have the slide for that. Uh, let me share. Um, so just write to me uh, to me directly, and it will be easier. And then I will tell you how to uh, not this one, sorry, this one. Uh, I will tell you how to proceed. So we have a uh, we have a contract to sign. A very uh, Quick contract, and then we give you access to the, the demo. We give you a token, and you can access to the demo. Maybe you will have a quick training just to explain you how it's working, and and that's all. But we are everybody is welcome to to use it. Uh, we are we are here to to test it when you, with the real situation, and uh, yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, no, thank you for that. And I've got one very quick question, which I know you kind of covered a bit in the presentation, but um, a couple of folks have pinged me on. Um, and would I'd love to just kind of delve dive into a bit deeper. So 
talking about what you have today, how is this different to or similar than something like ML Ops, which I think some people on the call will have heard a bit of, and I know you mentioned it in uh, in your presentation, but how does this how is this different than ML Ops that people? Yeah, you, you know, if you when when you are doing ML Ops. So the MLOps is the other solution to model drift. What you do in, in MLOps, you collect some data on the field, you upload them on your server, and then you, you use some data scientists to make new models. So if you have auto ML, you, are, you can do auto ML and create a new model. And then you, you need someone to validate this model, and then you have to download it back to the device. And uh, this is a very complex system because you have to, to communicate with the cloud, so you cannot be offline. And you have to, do, to have this infrastructure. For example, when uh, we go to, we have a customer which, who is an industrial, you have to deploy uh, edge, edge devices connected. You have to, you to, to have an eternal link a bit uh, everywhere in the, in the factory. So it's, it's not easy to deploy. And so the difference with what we do is that we, we don't have all those you know, communication with the backend. We do everything on the device. So everything is more easy. You don't have to, to have a EV infrastructure to do that. You can do it directly. And uh, usually when you do MLOps, you have a you, you have a delay, you know, because you have a, the delay, you have to collect the data from several devices. You have to do maybe uh, uh, several hours of training. And then you have to deploy again. So it, it can take uh, one week or one month. Uh, depending on the, you know, if your data scientist is available and so on, you know, to validate a new model, it can take a long. So, so, so you have to do to go to the full cycle again. So, the main difference is that is that you it's easier to deploy and is uh, the the delay to have a new model is faster. Uh, actually, uh, the delay the delay in our case is one second, uh, as you can you could see in the demo. Yeah, exactly. So it's great to give yeah. people this uh, this other option, right? If, uh, the ML ops, you know, and you look at your use cases and you think, oh, yeah, the ML ops is okay in some in cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah, no, do get in touch with, with Julian and the team on on in this. It's really great to see that you're you're working on any you know on your ARM processes. And actually, speaking of that, we've had a question in uh, from Reinhardt who says, "What compute power would be needed for the demo and example that you just showed? Would it work, for instance, on a Cortex M4 at a hundred megahertz?" Yeah, yeah, it, it, it will work uh, easily. Uh, actually, the, the main uh, the main bottleneck is a uh, memory. Usually, it's not not the CPU because uh, on the CPU uh, it's, it's easy for. So the more difficulties uh, to have uh, enough RAM actually to to create the model. So I, I, I show you in the demo. We need only ninety kilobytes for for this demo, for this exact demo. So we can train a NoCR model with ninety kilobytes. So this is what you got on a STM42, for example. So I'm, I'm for Cortex uh, for M4 device. So it's, it's OK. That's great. No, that's great. And um, yeah. for a couple of people we've asked in the in the chat as well, yes, everything today is being recorded. If you've missed any part of the talk, it's currently being live streamed on YouTube. So immediately afterwards, it takes yeah. a minute. And so you, you can play it by yourself. Available. Actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you yeah, can try yeah. it for yourself. So you can yeah. watch the recording from today, and you've got Da Vinci there. So you can do a bit of both right so yeah. it's great that um you know the recording from today will be available within five minutes of this talk finishing so if you've got any any part you've missed want to catch up on what julian or myself have said probably mostly yeah. julian actually i've not said much uh mine's not it mine's i'm irrelevant here you you're the star of the show um <laughs> that uh, if you want to uh to talk to julian reach out via email and watch the recording for sure um we've had a few more questions come in Thanks for this impressive performance improvement. Do you have real field applications that you want to focus on? I will also request this recording for my team should it be available. Yeah, so where, where we particular shine is on the sensors. You know, we can do some, uh, you know, automatic calibration of sensor, for example. Uh, we have a partner, a customer that is uh, doing uh, thermal sensor. And you know it's very. We you can you can put DaVinci on directly on the sensor and the sensor become intelligent. So instead of just sensing uh, the temperature of people, it gives the number of people in this room or it says this, this guy is, is sick, and so on and so on. So you you can put uh, added value to the sensor, and this is where we particularly shine. You know because we are very small, and we give more intelligence to the sensors. So this is uh, our main market. Let's say. But we can do also in industrial environment to do. Uh, uh, a command recognition or defect detection, you know, uh, 
uh, all, all that. Yeah. We can't do anything, but yeah, the sensor is the main, the main goal. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And yeah, do keep your questions coming in. We've got a few more minutes left to ask Julian your questions. So please do get them in. Um, so you presented classification problems. And this is actually one I had as well as uh, Elaine that's come in. So you presented a classification problem, right? And you've shown how easy it is with Da Vinci. Yeah. What about a regression type problem? Yeah, 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 I forgot to to, the, to tell about that. Yeah, exactly. We can uh, diplomat, so our algorithm can do both classification and regression. So, for example, for the regression is used for you know for putting a bounding box, you know, on images. We use a regression uh, mode of Da Vinci. And, and later on, we will we will have uh, unsupervised learning, but this will be uh, next year. We, we will focus on the regression and classification right now. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, it's uh, definitely give it a go if you're interested for get, get in touch with uh, Julian and try it out for sure. So uh, there's uh, someone who's uh, commented here. So I'm happy with TinyML. Uh, so an application you're using on the TinyML space. So I'm guessing they're not using um, any kind of ML ops or any sort of ML optimization here. Uh, sorry, oh, oh, ML ops yeah. types use cases, let's assume. Uh, and whoever's posted this, please do clarify the question if I misinterpret it. So they're happy with what they've got today. You know, they've deployed a device to the field. It's on device, low power with TinyML. Why should they use or and or switch to DaVinci and how much effort would this need? Um... It's a good question. <laughs> so if they are people with what they have, uh, they, they could stick with that. But uh, I, I think they will have the model drift problem one, one, one time or another. And where also uh, we shine is in the you know no data set option. Because when, when you do tiny ML, standard tiny ML, you have to build the data set. And this is a long process. And often the data is not available. You know, if you are doing dealing with uh, you know, a medical data. It's very hard to have. If you are dealing, I don't know, with a very specific sensor data, uh, you, you don't have that. So with DaVinci, you, you don't have this phase where you collect the data. You, you put DaVinci on the device and it's working. So it's easier. So is it easy to go from TinyML to, uh, to DaVinci? Yes, because you just have to install DaVinci on your device and it will work basically. This is my <laughs> yes, no, that's yeah, great. And yeah, you know, no matter yeah. what ARM Cortex you're deploying, it will it should just work. Yeah, yeah, it will, so, it will which is great. Actually, yeah. So there's a question here about the um the training, the put the demo you showed in the kind of training process. So where you showed that your heart was let's say like a, a zero anyway, what about training six to be the heart, for instance, or vice versa? Would that be possible in, in such cases? I guess it it is because you're telling the the model this is a this is a valid input versus a non-valid. Uh, so it's training six. Uh, I, I don't understand. Why. So you've your heart that you drew was yeah. interpreted I think, ah, as, a, heart, as, yeah. a, as a zero. So yeah. could you say, you know, could I train that when I write six, it converts it to a to, to a, a zero heart in this system, or to a zero, or to a heart, or something? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You can do anything. Actually, you can. Uh, what what you have to do is do to give a label to what you 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 draw. So if you you can give any label. So. The problem is that you, if you label your six as, as a zero, it, it will uh, you have a data set which is not correct because you have six in the zero class and six in the six class, it, it won't work uh, very well actually. So in that case, not, but you can, if you want to do, I, I don't know uh, what, what uh, the, the test I did yesterday is to use, you know, Roman uh, digits. And yes. I tried to, to teach Roman digits to, to this to the demo I show you, and it was working very fine. So you can do anything actually. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And that's the great thing about being able to do this is you can retrain and avoid yeah. that model drift and, and uh, yeah, what, which is good. What you want. Yeah, it's that we adapt to the user actually. Exactly. If you have a, you know yeah. and the the difference between maybe for to answer the previous question, the difference between tiny ML and what we are doing is that. In the case of time ML, the user adapts to the algorithm because you have to adapt the, you know, I, even with the 90% I show you without, without incremental learning, I managed to get the 90% actually by training myself to do the right digit. But it's not very good user experience. You know? you, it's not very acceptable. So the acceptance, you know, in the when you go to production, when you go to the factory, the operator, uh, uh, have a very low <laughs> acceptance rate. Is there to 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 
to learn how to use an algorithm, it doesn't work. It, it, it must be very, uh, very easy to use. And this is what we propose with DaVinci. We adapt the algorithm to the user and not, not mm -hmm. in the, the other direction. And it's super powerful. That's what's great. That is such a powerful way of looking at things. And this is yeah. this is why we love having you guys in the in the Arm AI partner program and as a valid and as a, a, a valuable member of our of our ecosystem. So, you know, thank you again for for showing thank, this. Thank you, Tobias. And um, one final question before we wrap up: Can you handle other kinds of raw data? It'd be maybe useful just to overview what data inputs you can. Yeah, input. yeah. I, I didn't go into details. So actually. In the in the beta version, we have three agents, three different agents. One which can handle uh, images, as I show. So we we try it, you know, with uh, with uh, defect recognition. So we are trying to 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 spot defects on the uh, soldering, you know, in in uh, production. Uh, so you can do anything with images uh, as long as it is a uh, JPEG images. We have uh, something for audio. So wave, so you can do user recognition. You can do some noise recognition. For example, we have a uh, we have a demo where we recognize different uh, ambient noises. So if you are on the street, in a, in a cafe, if you are in a, in an office, we can recognize. So it's, this is used, you know, in the headset to adapt the headset to to the ambient uh, noise. And then we have a generic use case where you, you, you give directly the signature that you access to. So in that case, you have to extract the signature from the raw signal and give it to DaVinci. And you give it in a CSV file, you know, standard CSV file, and DaVinci works on that. So you can do anything with that. And in the future version, we will be uh, so we will open a bit more DaVinci so you can do uh, whatever you want. But right now, we we close a bit the demo, to the, the beta version, sorry, for just for it to be easier to use and faster to, to take uh, in end. Brilliant. Thank you so much. What a, a fantastic answer to all those very diverse and engaged, uh, very you know, very diverse and interesting questions that we've had today. So Julian, what, and a fantastic presentation and demo. I mean, what more do you hope <laughs> for? And the, and the, and, the demo gods, and your demo gods shone on you, nothing broke. So we're all good. It's a, it's a great <laughs> talk today. So if you've missed any bit of it, as I mentioned, it'll be live on our YouTube channel immediately. The slides will go live within 24 hours. There'll be a link to those from the, there's a link to that on the uh, arm.com website. Uh, so just head there. As I mentioned, two weeks time, our final tech talk of the year. Can't believe we're saying that this year has flown by with the workshop getting started with AI on the edge from arm. You might know the speaker on that one. Uh, so do check that one out. Uh, it's going to be really, a really great uh, demo from our engineers, an opportunity to learn how you can use all our great tools to deploy AI at the edge from ARM. As I say, New Year, uh, we've got a, have a hope you have a Merry Christmas as well if we don't speak to you before then. In the new year, we're going to be moving, uh, transitioning away to a new platform, so away from Zoom uh, to a new platform with some very exciting new branding, new topics, speakers, and a whole bunch of uh, great initiatives that we've done. So really looking forward to that. In the meantime, uh, have a fantastic rest of the week. If you're in the US, uh, happy Thanksgiving. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks for the final Tech Talk of the Year. And thank you again, Julian, for a fantastic presentation. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, uh, and get in touch with these guys for uh, for all your for all your needs. So get in touch with them and, their, and the Bonsai team. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.